Hi everyone, I am Emily Bovier. I am in the psychology department and I'm going to be talking to you today about um, the general individual differences in accessibility needs. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you first. Um, I'm happy to share my slide deck with everybody once this is over as well. Um, and I have a few links to some PDFs that are also helpful if you're interested in the literature about this. Um, so in terms of talking about the psychology of accessibility needs, the main objectives for this session is it's aiming to cover just the psychological basis of those individual differences in primarily our students who have accessibility needs. And so the goal of this presentation here is to provide everyone a foundation for understanding what's called neurodiversity um, and encourage advocacy for our neurodiverse students. Um, this is not an exhaustive conversation about all of the types of neurodiversity, so I plan on just addressing a handful that might be more common in the classroom. Um, also, I want to use this as a way to provide a platform for discussing pedagogy that is accessible. So a lot of us, I think, are familiar with um, more common accommodations like extended um, time on exams or extensions on assignments or digital accessibility for students who might need to use screen readers. But in terms of accessible pedagogy, we'll talk a little bit more about strategies that we can use in the classroom that are good for all of our students, but that will provide primary support for neurodiverse students. Um, I'd also like to foster connections among professionals here at Oswego um, to address any challenges that we may have and generate support. So I'm coming at this as a faculty member, so as an instructor in the classroom. Um, and when we get a chance to do a little bit of discussion at the end, you know, we'll get to know everybody here and understand where you're coming from in terms of your role at the college. And we all have different levels of expertise that we might be able to combine together to better support our students. Um, and also at the end, I have some resources just to direct your attention to some complimentary sessions that are happening um, tomorrow, actually, that couple well with this line of conversation um, and just some other resources that CELL has available. So in terms of my background, um, I have a master's in applied clinical psychology, um, but it should be noted that my work with clinical psychology over the last you know, 10 to 15 years has been primarily academic. So even though I have clinical practice experience, that was early on in my career. Um, and since then, I switched my focus and was primarily academic. Um, so I was motivated to join the Accessibility Fellowship last year after I gained a better understanding of how accessibility fit into diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so that really aligned well with my personal and professional philosophy in terms of teaching. And that it also provided me a really nice platform to be able to merge, um, you know, professionalism um, in terms of service to the college and service to the department, my research and my teaching practices. And again, depending on where you're coming from, whether you are a faculty member or um, in the library or other support services on campus, um, you might be thinking about this through a different lens. Um, so. I'm gonna to talk to you about individual differences in accessibility needs. And I'll give some examples, including attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, autism spectrum disorders, and some general learning disabilities. I also wanna spend some time thinking about how general mental health, more generalized uh, conditions, such as anxiety and depression, might also be um, presenting opportunities for us to make our materials more accessible to students. I think this is particularly relevant now, considering that we are entering our third year of a pandemic and students are experiencing significant mental health concerns. Um, so a lot of the literature on neurodiversity has focused on some of these other special conditions, but I think we're gonna have to start thinking about the way in which anxiety and depression can impact general cognitive functioning that might cause some challenges for students in the classroom setting. Um, and as I mentioned, as we talk about each of these particular um, neurodiversity examples, we'll also talk about how we can include certain pedagogical approaches to help support those students. 
And then I'd like to hear from everybody as well. Um, I'm relatively new to this area. Again, I have background in it, but looking at it all through this new lens. Um, so I'm interested to know for those of us who are faculty members, what sort of challenges might we face in trying to make our materials accessible for neurodiverse students? And then also um, what sort of support we might need or shared expertise among all of us that might be helpful. So that's the general overview of, of what we're gonna work through today. Um, so in terms of neurodiversity, for those of you that are not familiar with this term, generally it refers to individual differences in brain function and behavioral traits. And the idea of neurodiversity being a disability, quote unquote, can in part be due to just general attitudes or actions from society. And so that basically refers to the social model of disability. So in general, the idea that there is a norm or a typical way of functioning can be very misleading. So we all exist on some form of a continuum in terms of our capacities. And so what we want to do is to look at this as a continuum. And this highlights the importance of considering more strength-based strategies in the college learning environment. And the great thing is, is that we already do this as educators. I think it's a matter of looking at it through this lens to realize what we already do and how we can make improvements to those strategies. Um, so the goal is to basically promote inclusion and promote student confidence. And that aligns with culturally relevant pedagogy. So in approaching neurodiversity and this sort of broader understanding, I found these two sources very helpful. Um, I'm going to walk you through some of the findings um, in this first source that basically looked at all of the literature um, and highlighted different samples of neurodiverse students, how higher education viewed neurodiverse students and how the students reacted, and then ways that they found support in their college learning environment. This second source is just a really great overview of culturally relevant pedagogy and how it can be applied to neurodiversity and various ways that we can lend support to our students in our classroom environment. Um, all right, so let's walk through a couple examples of neurodiversity. And in doing this, I, I might flip back and forth between the next slide, which gives you um, specific quotes from that study that I mentioned that did a literature review and basically combined all the key findings from research that looks at neurodiversity in higher education. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, if you think about um, the general description of this, oftentimes it's associated with childhood behavior, but if you think about the way it might manifest in late adolescence into adulthood, it might be related more to cognitive processing. So you might not see overt behaviors that are typically associated with children who have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but the way it's manifesting is a lot to do with the thought processes and the way in which um, students who have a diagnosis of ADHD might get distracted very easily, um, and they might need more support in terms of having concrete objectives, concrete steps, um, perhaps breaks throughout the class in order to help maintain their attention. Um, and again, this is not an exhaustive list and I'm giving a very superficial overview. Um, it's important to note that individuals with these particular diagnoses are all incredibly diverse in terms of um, the challenges that they may face. Um, in terms of autism spectrum disorders, again, this is known as more of a continuum. So previously they had more categorical um, diagnoses of autism and Asperger's, but this exists more, again, on a continuum. And um, a lot of times it manifests in terms of very uh, standardized routines that students might have. Um, sometimes there might be challenges with flexibility in terms of those routines. So that sort of points to the importance of having consistency in our assignment formatting and due dates, for example, um, if students have a hard time rearranging their schedules to accommodate 
um, last minute changes to a course structure, let's say. There's also um, a social element to autism spectrum disorders. And as I was reading more about this through the lens of accessibility in the classroom, it had not really occurred to me this idea of what's called a hidden curriculum. And so that was really impactful to me to think about that in terms of myself as an instructor and what I do, even just with my facial expressions and my voice and how I communicate to students during a lecture. And oftentimes I will direct attention to that, but I probably implicitly rely on fluctuations in my tone of voice as a way to capture students' attention um, and highlight specific content that I think is important, especially during a discussion where you might not have as much of an outline on a PowerPoint, for example, for students to follow. So that reading of social cues can be very difficult for students. And if you embed, if you implicitly use social cues as a way to direct attention in your classroom, that might have an impact on students who have um, challenges with understanding social cues, like with autism spectrum disorders. Um, there's also learning difficulties that are related to dyslexia and dyspraxia, which mainly deal with um, uh, basically dyspraxia has to do with movement coordination and dyslexia has to do basically with reading comprehension. Um, there's also more specific um, conditions that are related to arithmetic as well. So math can be included in here. These ones I think some of us are more familiar with and the general accommodations can include things like using screen readers, um, but it's important to sort of include those in our understanding of neurodiversity and general changes that we might be able to make could help support those students, you know, above and beyond some of the other accommodations that they might already receive. Um, and again, kind of as we're talking about this, I think it's important to consider the role of anxiety and depression and how um, something like generalized anxiety in which students are operating under high levels of stress sort of continuously. Um, and those levels of anxiety can impact the way in which they are able to focus, able to retain information, maintain consistency with their studies. Um, in terms of our personal judgments of what might be considered a stressor, it's important to consider that at this point, people might be experiencing hardships that are hard to make a subjective judgment about whether or not that is quote unquote impacting a student. So you have to learn to trust the student in terms of what they might be experiencing. So in terms of ways that we can support our students, and again, not an exhaustive list, just some big picture points that I pulled out from those first two resources. The first is to just acknowledge acceptance for neurodiversity. Um, and a conference that I attended in the fall was talking about diversity statements in syllabi. And um, I know we have a diversity statement for SUNY Oswego, and we also have a statement about accessibility services. But I think even acknowledging something more explicit about the safe place in the classroom for students who are neurodiverse, especially because we know that disclosure um, can be very stress inducing for students. Also, it may be that students are not fully aware of what they may be experiencing and challenges that they may face. So um, there are some broader considerations at the college level and how we can lend support to students, but I'm looking at this more from um, the, the classroom experience. So another important aspect is to teach for student success, but you wanna maintain those, those high standards that you have in the classroom. Um, and so in order to do this, the Universal Design for Learning has very solid principles that can support neurodiverse students. Um, these include, these are just a couple of things that stood out to me the most, um, diverse content offerings. And so this could include um, basically having lecture-based materials, offering recordings, discussion-based materials, ensuring that the way in which you offer up your content, there's multiple formats of that so that the students can, you're setting them up for success essentially, and they're able to find what works best for them without them having to come to you and disclose what they might be experiencing. So they're able to find what works best for them based on just your general content. 
The other um, suggestion is to have alternative assignment options. Um, and I know some folks that I have talked to have started to see this in accommodation letters that students, um, let's say if the goal is to, the assignment is to write a paper, but the student might prefer a, a verbal presentation or if there are presentations in the class, the student might have an accommodation in which they can have a one-on-one -on -one presentation with you as the instructor, um, or perhaps a pre-recorded presentation to address um, some of the uh, neurodiverse experiences of students. So as, as we're thinking about these pedagogical considerations, I want everyone to think about, you know, what are some challenges that we might face as educators in creating these alternative assignment options, in having diverse content offerings. Um, I imagine this is different across all departments, depending on these, the larger learning objectives, not only for your class, but for the department and for the major as well. Um, so I know even within psychology, I've thought of a handful of challenges that I might face as an educator in attempting to have all of these alternative assignment options but still meeting the, the main learning objectives for the major itself that are outlined by the American Psychological Association. But it, it takes a lot of creativity. And I think as we continue to work towards this, we can start building some resources among faculty who um, have some suggestions for creating these uh, more accessible classroom environments. All right, so what I want to do now is there's a lot of text on this slide, but I just want to share with you some sample findings um, from a I've selected three different neurodiverse conditions that I found to be the most impactful. Um, before I go through these, let me just show you what I'm actually looking at. This is the reference um, that I linked you to, and you'll see that they went through dozens of studies that looked at the experience of neurodiverse students in higher education. And they highlight which neurodiverse condition was focused on, and they had key findings and recommendations from each study. So this is pretty exhaustive. There's a lot of these on here. So I just chose to highlight a few that I found to be impactful and might just sort of give us a platform for discussing a little bit more. Um, so for autism spectrum disorders, ASD, uh, one study, the key finding was that support groups helped reduce loneliness and anxiety and increased self-esteem. Universal design strategies included flexible teaching approaches, digitally accessible materials, intuitive grading rubrics and syllabi, and technology that helped these students. Um, one thing that stood out to me was this, this term intuitive grading rubrics and syllabi. And this is something that, that I consider and uh, have to continuously work on as an instructor because what might seem intuitive to me might not necessarily be intuitive to students. So it is a process as you continue to uh, prep a course, let's say. Uh, one of my mentors told me that by the third or fourth time you teach a course, that's when you start to feel really confident with it. Um, so grading rubrics, right, might feel intuitive to me, but one thing that I learned with teaching for upper division senior students who are writing their capstone is that terminology that I was using in the rubric, they still weren't entirely clear on what I even meant by that. So it's helpful for all students, right? Just as we talk about general accessibility, um, making changes to our content is beneficial to all students. Um, so going back to this, for students with dyslexia, self-knowledge, motivation, advocacy, and academic skills overcame barriers to learning, and a combination of instructional strategies, universal design for learning, and social learning helped student achievement. And so uh, another takeaway from this is that, you know, this is just one piece of the puzzle, thinking about the college learning environment, but as you'll notice, there's a lot of other aspects in this in terms of support groups, and we might be dealing with some other um, mental health related issues that stem not from the neurodiverse condition itself, but again, the attitudes and the actions of society that might contribute to things like loneliness and anxiety because of the structure in which the student finds themselves in. Um, and then finally, with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, 
Um, students struggled with negative thoughts, poor self-esteem, irregular lifestyles due to poor time management, dissatisfaction with academic performance and interpersonal relationships. And what was helpful was coaching combined with cognitive behavioral therapy and psychoeducational techniques. So with this, I think in terms of the classroom setting, if you are transparent about your strategies in the classroom, and you also embed within your classroom um, broader skills like learning how to learn, that can help students set them up for success. All right, um, so at this point, and I haven't seen anything pop up in the chat yet, but I'm gonna stop my screen share in a second just so that I can see everybody. But I want to just spend some time chatting very informally about challenges you might anticipate or you may have encountered in your efforts to support neurodiverse students. And then if you have any thoughts about what additional support would promote your efforts to support those students, I'd love to hear from people about that as well. Um, I can actually start the first question, challenges that I have actually encountered in my efforts to support neurodiverse students. So I'm gonna stop my screen share here for a second. Um, so at the end of this past semester, a few weeks after grades had been submitted, I had a student write to me and ask for an extension on the last two quizzes. And this student disclosed to me that they're autistic and they did not seek out services because they wanted to try a semester and see how it worked out for them. So this student had failed the course and was requesting essentially 20 points worth of quizzes extension to possibly bump them up to um, a D in the course. And, and I really had to think this through. Um, so what I did is I reflected on my general principles in the course, and I made the decision that I felt like I had put enough, I had made my materials accessible enough for students in terms of um, flexibility in the assignments, consistency in the due dates, consistencies in the reminders of the due dates, automatic bonus points for students already in the class. Um, so in my, I still haven't finalized this decision yet, but you know, I wrote back to the student and asked if they were a psychology major and tried to engage them a little bit more to understand where they were coming from. But the other thing to consider is, you know, I told the student that I would consult with colleagues and, and try to make a decision about this. Um, so in my gut, I feel like my materials were accessible enough to the student, but at the same time, how am I to judge this? Um, how am I to ensure that I was fair to the rest of the students in the class as well? So that was a big challenge that I'm currently facing. Um, another thing to consider is that when a student does disclose this, and feels rejected by this disclosure, that can have significant impact. Um, I have personal experience with this because my youngest brother um, is on the autism spectrum. And so I understand, and he, and he is very aware, he's very self-aware of, of what he experiences and how it is quote unquote different from other people. Um, and the way in which people might interact with him in society can, feel very soul crushing sometimes, right? So I am kind of struggling between my classroom principles and then also trying to recognize the step that this student make to disclose what they may have needed in terms of accommodations. So that's my, my challenge um, is the more after the fact, right? Without that formal accessibility statement of what the accommodations that student may have formally needed versus understanding that there are neurodiverse students and sometimes there has to be some flexibility, um, but then how do you maintain it with your standards for the course? So um, if anyone wants to jump off of that or share some of their own perspectives or any other questions that you might have, um, open discussion here. And, and if you do chime in, I, I know most people here, but feel free to um, say who you are, what department you're in, where you're coming from, maybe why you're here in this session. Anyone wanna jump in? <laughs> 
Laura. Um, I'll jump in. My name is Laura Donnelly, and I teach in English and creative writing, um, mostly creative writing workshops. And um, first, thank you for doing this, Emily. And what you were just saying in terms of the of sort of the after the fact challenge is one I've also experienced, and um, not not after the semester is done, but sometimes a well, last semester I had a student who kind of like disappeared for two weeks mm -hmm. and then came back and disclosed various challenges that were going on um, with that student. And then my other kind of question or challenge I'll bring up has maybe a, maybe more to do with um, depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. um, but might be intersecting with some of these other mm -hmm. challenges also mm -hmm. disclosed or not by the students. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, I, I tend to be very consistent, very clear with everything. And in the past have largely then stayed with that. I've tried to be like empathetic with students and say, this isn't a personal judgment, but you know, this is what I've laid out. I've changed that a lot because partially because of the pandemic, partially because of attending more sessions like this. Um, but one area where I've, I've made things a lot more flexible, um, but in some cases still run up to the limit of where I'm like, I, do, I don't know at this point is with attendance. Yeah. Um, I teach small workshop classes. They're usually 19 to 22 students. It's all, you know, discussion, interaction. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to, to figure out the amount of leeway for, for attendance. I have really opened that up in the past semester for a range of things that can be warranted as excused absences and then working with students on alternate things. Um, but in a couple cases and a couple cases, it, it got to the point where a student had missed what, what would account to like a month of class basically. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about that as I go into this semester and how to, how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. Has anyone seen on an accommodation letter sensitivity to absences? Mm -hmm. I did receive that. And, and this is where I think um, connecting with like, if star, we could connect with star and understand what, what that means, right? So sensitivity to absences and depending on the structure of your class and the role that attendance plays in, in the grade, right? So in one of my classes, it's primarily lecture-based. Um, they have access to slide decks after the fact. Most of the participation activities are online through Blackboard outside of class. Um, and so I feel like with that, attendance is not a big part of, of the student's grade, but in other classes that would be. And so the idea of a sensitivity to an absence, what does that mean as the instructor in terms of what sort of accommodations can I make for the student? Um, so again, that's where like connecting all of us here at the college and getting a better understanding of what that actually looks like. Cause even for me, that's that's still unclear at this point, but I think, yes, yeah, some other people have said, um, yeah, we've seen that in the accommodation letters. So that's a good point to attendance in terms of attendance policies and how to make them flexible enough without it, you know, impairing, but without basically preventing the student from being successful, right? So you want to set them up for success by having some structure, but at some point you want to allow flexibility um, for some students who might actually be sensitive to those absences or based on their accommodation needs um, will be absent from class sometimes. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Hi, Emily. Um, I'm Pat Devendor from Accessibility Resources. Hi, Pat. How are you? Good, how are you? Uh, it's funny you mentioned sensitivity to absences. The exact line that I give students when I meet with them is that it does not absolve you of any attendance policy the professor may have. Sure, okay, yeah. Um, you're still responsible for the material. What we want students to get out of it is basically to let instructors know that this may happen. Mm -hmm. they, but at the end of the day, it's one of those accommodations. It's very, it's a, basically a double-edged sword. Right, yeah. So uh, I, I speak with students very specifically about that and say, this is exactly what this means. It's not a, and pardon the analogy, it's not a get out of jail free card. Sure. Um, yeah. You're still responsible. And if you're not there for enough of the class, then the professor is well within their rights to do whatever they need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I sort of assumed it was like that, but that 
having that information as the instructor might change my the way in which I interact with that student or approach that student about absences and allow for a little bit more empathy and understand that there's there's something going on here that enables that accommodation. Um, but I've had other, I've talked with other folks who look at it from like a little bit of a different perspective and understanding like, what does this mean for my attendance policy? And so that's that's good to know. And we can make that a little more clear to some folks who, who've received that accommodation that it's not an altering of the attendance policy per se, but more just an understanding that this student has had that accommodation. And again, a lot of it is the, um, the anxiety and stress that relates to having to disclose what they're going through. I went through that as, a, as an undergraduate that had nothing to do with my neurodiversity, just personal um, circumstances. And I did not feel comfortable going to my instructor to disclose, this is why I'm missing these classes. And this is why I, I just did it on my own and made up as best as I could and didn't perform as well in the classes I had hoped. And um, so I think, yeah, having that as a tool, it just is that gap, it, it bridges that gap for students to be able to have that discussion with their instructors. And kind of jumping back to what you had said previously, one of the things that I think is fantastic is that ability to have different um, assignments. Like mm -hmm. we will have students who will literally be physically ill if they have to give a presentation. Mm -hmm. um, having them have that ability to maybe write a paper or to record it and then be able to, to do it that way. I think that is a fantastic idea because yeah. then you're reaching out to the student and finding a lot of different ways. So you as the instructor can receive the information, you know, what do they know? Um, mm -hmm. but maybe in a way that's not gonna, you know, cause them undue stress. Right, and I think, you know, when, when considering this from a course design perspective, if the, if the learning objective is oral communication skills, right? It's like that can be, it, you can have multiple settings in which that can occur. Um, same thing with written communication skills. And, and a lot of it has, uh, there is a lot of, you know, a social element to it in terms of the stress and anxiety that students experience. Um, and the way I've thought about it, this is just my personal philosophy. Anytime I've done oral presentations, I've had students ask me, do I have to dress professionally, for example? And this is my personal philosophy. I say, I, I cannot make a judgment on your physical appearance, right? So I do not do that. But then it's sort of the same way if you think about the way that you are evaluating a student's verbal performance, tone of voice, facial expression, eye contact. There are many things that um, may have been included or are included in professor's criteria that just do not fit for, for some students and could put them at a disadvantage. Um, so I've been trying to think about it exactly like that. Like I wouldn't make a judgment based on your physical clothing for your presentation. So therefore, you know, tone of voice and fluctuation in voice or things like that, um, or eye contact, even um, flexibility in terms of responding to questions from an audience, right? Like sometimes we want to promote students to be able to think on their toes and be flexible, but depending, especially someone with autism spectrum disorder, for example, might have a very, uh, what we perceive as rigid approach and inflexible in the ability to then accommodate an incoming question. Um, so it's important to consider those things. And again, think back to what's the core objective and we can achieve core objectives while allowing for some flexibility in terms of the format or the execution of the assignment. But challenging, right, as an instructor to be able to, to allow, to come up with those opportunities, right, even generating one assignment sometimes is, is challenging, um, but then to have multiple formats um, and then consistency in the rubrics across those formats can be challenging. So some, those are some of the things that I have thought about um, I'm actually teaching a course this semester for upper division psychology students that is on individual differences and in accessibility needs. Um, and so I have to practice what I preach and come up with multiple assignment formats and multiple ways for them to get their presentation criteria um, and considering group work and how I evaluate participation in group work. So um, lots to think about. Anyone else wanna chime in with Challenges, or how about support? What what additional support might pro, might promote our efforts? 
Um, I will say, let me lend you some support. I'm going to share my screen again really quick. So here are some complimentary resources um, that I think will be beneficial. There's some upcoming breakout sessions um, tomorrow that I think will complement this talk. Um, so John and Rebecca have some talks, creating an inclusive environment, um, three pillars of motivation, belonging, agency, and structure that might be good for those students. If you think back to um, the findings that I showed you that support and coaching and motivation were really impactful for neurodiverse students. Um, tomorrow, there's also a session on the impact of intersectionality on mental health. Um, there's a T for Teaching podcast on disability in higher education. And um, I was also part of the AQ cohort a couple of years ago. And those instructional resources are incredibly helpful. They may not have necessarily been presented through the lens of um, creating accessible pedagogy, but with that framework, I think you can go back through. Um, so I know uh, Andrea Vickery is currently, I believe she is the one that is running alongside John, the, the AQ cohort for this year. Um, and they have had some, some sessions. So I recommend um, jumping in on those as well. And then thinking about those approaches through this lens of um, accessibility for neurodiverse students. Um, and then some just additional resources, um, the potential for universal design for learning with regards to mental health issues. There's a mental health and disability higher education report that came out last year, just so we can understand what our students um, might be experiencing, some of the challenges that they may face. Um, and again, this is, there's, there's multiple layers to, to this, right? There's the, at the college wide level, at the department level, at the um, classroom level, uh, social aspects, academic aspects, lots of different things at work here. I approached it from more of a classroom perspective, but I don't think that should be considered in isolation. Think about it in terms of the big picture and everything that's going on in the lives of our students um, at the college.